the month of June, we spent some time traveling together on our road trip. We followed Jesus through a good portion of Israel and in our travels together. And now that it's a new month, a new season, as we're moving forward, we're going to try a little something different here. Uh, we're going to go back to the Old Testament. Uh, we'll just look at some old school guys, some, some folks from the Old Testament that, that might have something to teach us, something to show us about life here and now, something that we might engage with. Uh, so the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about different Old Testament characters uh, that, that really have something to say to us uh, in our time here and now. So I'll invite you uh, to turn to Genesis chapter 12, or it's printed in your bulletin, and hear Genesis 12, 1 through 8. Hear this story this morning. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother son, son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, as we open your word today, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we might follow you into this great mission that you have for each and every one of us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, over this last week, I had the weirdest experience. It was strange. I, I sat down on my couch. <laughs> like, yeah, I sat down on my couch, and, and I... I didn't do anything for a couple of hours. It, it was straight. Like, I just feel like uh, uh, since January, it's kind of been a lot of motion, been a lot of things going on in life. And, and, uh, and so finally, this last week, I, I, camp meeting was over. God and country was over. You know, like I had this moment where I sat down on my couch and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this. This is nice. But it. It also brought back some, some memories, some thoughts, some things that, that I, I thought about while sitting on that couch. Because see, uh, when we moved, um, my, my wife, who I love very much and is much smarter and better looking than I am, uh, she decided that we needed new furniture. <laughs> new house, new furniture. That, that was the deal. I said, yes, ma'am. Because I'm smart. Okay. <laughs> And so, so we got new couches, and as I sat on that couch, I thought to myself, this just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like our old couch. It doesn't feel like the, the one that we had before. And, and really, it doesn't feel like my chair. Do you know about the chair? <laughs> I, I had this chair for a number of years, and me and that chair, we had a relationship. I love that chair. It, it knew the contours of my back. It knew how I like to sit. That chair, I, I loved it. You know, I haven't had it two houses ago. It's, it's gone. It's been long gone. It's been, it probably needed to go, but I loved that chair. I loved the way that it felt so natural and comfortable, and you just, nobody else could sit in it, right? You know, you, you got that one chair that... that that is your chair, and if somebody else is sitting in it, you walk by and you give them the eye. This is my chair. It's my spot. It's my place. You feel comfortable there. You feel at home there. I could sink into that chair and just binge watch TV. 
I could have watched it. I could have watched the whole series of of Stranger Things. I could, I could have done it, but I didn't have my chair, so I couldn't pull it off. I was comfortable there. What's strange about getting comfortable in things is that sometimes we find ourselves a little stuck. I, I could sit in that chair and get a little stuck. I could sit there for too long and and not get up and do the things that needed to get done in life. I could get stuck in that moment and not be able to do what needed to get done. I think sometimes, even beyond chairs, even beyond places on the couch, in our lives each and every day, there are places where we feel a little stuck. Right? In our relationships, we feel stuck. Our relationships with our spouse or with our children, or we, we feel a little stuck. Maybe, maybe in our jobs, we feel a little stuck. I, I have a lot of people who come to me, and they'll, they'll talk to me about their faith journey. And they'll say, I, I feel a little stuck in my faith journey. It's like it's not progressing forward the way that I thought it would. I, I used to feel God's presence in this unique way, and I just don't feel it as much anymore. I feel... A little stuck. The good news for you, whether you're a person of faith or not, is that what we learn from the story of Abram can help any of us who feel stuck. It can help us move beyond that place where we've been for a long time. See, God shows up to Abram, who's been in the same place for 75 years. God says, Abram, I, I need you to get unstuck. I need you to get up and I need you to go. I need you to do something because this, this is the way that I designed the world to work. You know, way back in Genesis and when God's making things, he, he looks at them and he says, be fruitful and multiply and go throughout the earth because God is all about blessing all of creation. But... People did exactly what we do, and they, they got stuck in their ways. They got stuck in these moments. They got stuck in these places. And as we read in Genesis chapter 11, there's this story of the Tower of Babel. You may be familiar with this story. The people decide they're going to build a tower to heaven. And the reason that they give is fascinating. They say, we don't want to be scattered across the whole world. We don't want to go. We like it right here. We know where we are. We're comfortable where we are. And we want to stay. We know all the best places to go after church for lunch. We've got our favorite sandwich shop. We know the best Mexican food places. We don't want to go anywhere. We like it right here. We just want to stay. And so we're going to build a tower to God to tell God, hey, we're, we're, we're good. Thanks. We're going to stay stuck because it's easier for us to stay stuck than it is to go and to do something new. It's easier for us to stay right where we are and keep doing the things that we've been doing day in and day out as opposed to doing something new. God, we don't really want to do that. So when God shows up to a nothing man in the middle of a nothing place named Abram, it's with this story as the backdrop. And God shows up to Abram and he says, hey, I need you to go. I need you to leave all the things that are familiar. I need you to get up and start moving. Start moving in the direction that I'm going to show you. I'm not even going to tell you where we're going yet. I just need you to pack up all your things, leave your family's house, leave all the people that you know. I need you to get up and go. Because God is all about sending us out. God is all about us moving forward in our relationships, in our faith journey, every aspect of our lives. God says, Abram, I need you to get up and start moving. And then God makes him this great promise. Again, Abram, there's nothing special about him. He's just like us, just normal, 
everyday average guy in this time, and God speaks to him and says, Abram, I need you to get up and go into the land that I'm going to show you, and I am going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the nations. Now, I, I got to pause for a minute. When we start talking about the word blessed, I, I get a little bit nervous because w- w- our culture has kind of stolen this word from us a little bit. Uh, back in, in like 2014, early 2015, uh, this word became a hashtag that was incredibly popular. Do you know what a hashtag is? It's like a, it's a, it's a pound sign, okay, for, for anybody. It's a pound sign for the internet. And it's a way of searching different material. So if you posted a picture on Instagram, you would put a hashtag at the bottom that described it in some way, shape, or form so that other people might look at it. So if you look at any of my wife's photos on Instagram, they all say, hashtag our family of five. So if you ever want to see all of our pictures, there you go. I know that's creepy and weird, but that's the way the internet works. So back in 2014, this, this celebrity uh, decided to start using this hashtag to talk about, you know, different opportunities that they had, different meals or whatever. And so they started using hashtag blessed, and, and the internet exploded, right? Everybody started using this. Everyone would just use the, this, this hashtag blessed to describe all sorts of different things. And, and then we put it on shirts and bumper stickers and, and hats and everything else. And I read this really interesting article this last week, written by a social scientist who said, essentially what we did with the word blessed was we equated it with the word lucky. We're walking down the street and find a quarter. Hashtag blessed. Lucky. And it made the Old Testament lover in me shudder a little bit. To think that this beautiful, deep word had been watered down to the point where we just thought it meant we're lucky. God meets this man named Abram, who we later call Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had. All right, good, you've been to vacation Bible school. Um, meets this guy it, it just in, in, in a nowhere town and says, I've got great news for you. I need you to get up and go. And in your going is the way the Hebrew is literally translated. I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. The two are not separatable. You can't separate God's blessing to Abram from his ability to bless others. The two are intimately connected, and they are that way throughout Scripture. If we think about it, there's this vertical and horizontal nature to all of God's movement in our lives. God says to each and every one of us, look, I need you to get up and go and bless others, and as you bless others, you'll find that you are blessed. It happens time and time again. In fact, if we really think about the way that this is is rolled out, it sounds a lot like the words of Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. These two things are so incredibly important. This vertical aspect of God blessing Abram, showing up and saying, you are blessed for no other reason than you are a beloved creation of God and you take that blessing and you go and you bless others. Love God, love others. Love God love others. It's the story of Scripture. It's the story that we as the church are invited to live into. It's this self-reciprocating blessing of those of us who are called blessed are also called to be a blessing. It's the missional framework for what God is doing in the world. God is sending people to go to be a blessing. And it's amazing what happens when we start blessing other people, what happens in our own lives. We were in uh, Costa Rica a number of years ago. I had taken some youth there on a mission trip, and, and uh, we had somehow gotten connected with this little town outside of San Jose, and it was 
uh, it was essentially a, a drug town. Like the, everybody from the community knew it and they would go there to buy drugs and then leave and that it was guarded on both entrances by like men with big guns. And so why wouldn't you take a group of youth there? <laughs> Don't you wish I was your kid's youth pastor? I, I, well, yeah, thank you, I was. Some, some of you. So, so we, we, we had gone there one year and, and we, uh, we worked with this church that had bought a brothel and we were helping them turn it into a child development center because that made sense. <laughs> and, and so we had gone there one year and worked and the, the problem I had was that we just stayed inside the building most of the time. I was like, oh, I want to engage with the community. I want to meet some Costa Rican drug dealers. Like you do. <laughs> and so, uh, so I came up with this brilliant idea that only an American would come up with. We're going to host a barbecue, <laughs> a cookout, in the middle of this, this drug town. We're going to go to Costa Rica, we're going to buy hot dogs and hot dog buns, and we're going to have a good old-fashioned cookout. And then we're going to get to meet some Costa Rican drug dealers. This is going to be great. So we do this. And in, in Costa Rica, like, cookout doesn't make sense. Like, that's, it's just not a context for it. And, and so we had to work really hard to find hot dogs. You'd think that you could find a hot dog anywhere. It's tough to find a hot dog in Costa Rica. We had to find, like, the one American uh, grocery store in, in San Jose. And we bought all of the hot dogs and, like, both stale buns that they had. And, and we went and we, we had this cookout in the middle of, of this, this town. And uh, all of the kids came out. All of the kids came and they, you know, they, were, they were having hot dogs and we were having a great time. We were all playing with them. And, and it was so good, except no Costa Rican drug dealers. <laughs> Just kids. And I was kind of disappointed. But then the most amazing thing happened. These kids who had had their fill of hot dogs started getting the extra hot dogs that we have and taking them to different houses. And all of a sudden, the people in the houses started coming out to see what was going on. Like those kids who had been blessed were now blessing other people with what they had been blessed with. And all of a sudden, we had all these Costa Rican drug lords having a cookout with us. It was incredible. It was this moment where like, you just saw God doing something and you were like, that went better than I thought it would. God just showed up. We shouldn't be surprised because when we're willing to go and to get out of that place where we're stuck, and we're willing to bless others. God shows up in those moments. God does something incredible, something amazing. And we're willing to bless others. Christopher Wright, one of my favorite authors, wrote a, a great book called The Mission of God. He talks about it this way. He said, God's promised to bless Abraham with a covenant relationship in which Abraham responded in faith and obedience. Abraham got up and went. God, he did what God asked him to do, which was strange and unusual because he had no pretext to do this. He just did it because God asked him to. And that remained the pattern for Israel. Blessing wasn't automatic or mechanical. And the blessing of salvation called for the response of covenantal obedience in order for the blessing to go on being enjoyed. O obedience is the means of living within the sphere of blessing and enjoying it. Obedience is never the means of earning or deserving the blessing. Obedience, let me read that again. Obedience is the means of living within the sphere of blessing and enjoying it. It's never the means of earning or deserving the blessing. In other words, God does the blessing, but as long as we're willing to go and to be a blessing, we're living in this sphere of blessing, and we find that we are blessed. It just happens over and over and over again. We, we find that as we bless others, we feel less and less stuck. We feel more and more connected. We feel more of God's presence God does something 
amazing in our lives. I'm serious. Try this in some place that you're stuck in your life. Stuck in your relationship with your spouse. Just start blessing them for no good reason at all. They're not going to say, no, 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 you've blessed me too much. (laughs) Try it with your kids. Maybe you can do too much there. I don't know. Try it at your places of work, with your coworkers, with your customers. Try it with someone in our community that you wouldn't normally engage with. Even just a kind word or a loving gesture, a gift, a piece of watermelon, a lunch. And see if God doesn't meet you there in that moment and remind you the blessings that he's showered out upon you. This is a command from God. The the Hebrew in this verse is, is the imperative. God says, go and do this. Be a blessing. We think blessings is something that happens to us. We get this or we get that or we've got this experience or that experience. But blessing isn't something that happens to us. Blessing is something that happens through us. God has been using humanity to bring about his reign and rule in the world since the beginning of time. Go and multiply and be blessed and bless those who you come in contact with. There's this story of another man named Abraham. I thought it was appropriate since we're talking about Abraham. So, you know, Abraham, father of many nations. Abraham Lincoln, one of the fathers of our you know, country. I thought, I thought it was a good story. The story's been told of Abraham Lincoln who worshipped each and every Wednesday when he was in Washington, D.C. at the New York Presbyterian Church right near the White House. One Wednesday evening as Lincoln was leaving the service, one of his assistants asked him, Mr. President, what did you think of the sermon tonight? And Lincoln responded, The content was excellent, and Dr. Gurley spoke with great eloquence. It was obvious that he had put a great deal of work into that sermon. So then you thought it was a great sermon, Mr. President, the assistant asked. Lincoln said, No, I did not say that. But sir, you said it was an excellent sermon. Lincoln replied, No. I said that the content was excellent and that the preacher spoke with eloquence. But Dr. Gurley on this night forgot one important matter. He forgot to ask us to do something great. God shows up. This man named Abram. In the middle of the desert. Who's been stuck for 75 years doesn't have any intentions of getting unstuck and asks him to do something great. Get up and go. Be a blessing. And as you go, you will be blessed. What a great call for him. What a great call for us. Let us do something just as great. Because we have the same call. Go and bless others. And in your going, you will be blessed. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we spend so much of our life stuck. God, help us to live a truly blessed life, one in which we bless others and we get to experience covenant obedience, the goodness of your presence each and every day. God, we know you do something unique and something amazing when we're willing to get up and go and to bless others. God, help us to move beyond those places where we feel stuck in our relationships, in our jobs, in our connection with you. God, help us to move forward, to grow, to be willing to step out and go 
even before we have a full picture of what it all looks like. God, give us faith to be obedient to this missional call to go and bless. How do we pray all of this in Jesus' name? Amen.